Good afternoon, veterans and families and honored guests and all who share an interest in the history of our great nation. Welcome, one and all, to the Arsenal of Democracy World War II Capital Victory Flyover. My name is Rob Ryder. I'm an air show announcer, and I, along with you, are here to commemorate victory in World War II. And it is fitting that we do this today on the 70th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day, VE Day. Today, you will see history pass before your eyes. As I speak, more than 50 vintage World War II aircraft are circling over Virginia, just outside Washington. And within the next few minutes, they'll start flying down the Potomac River in groups of two and three and four. Then, at about two minute intervals, those small groups of aircraft, most of them traveling at speeds approaching 190 miles per hour, will take a left turn at the Lincoln Memorial and pass by us to the south. Watch closely, because as they pass, most of the aircraft will be visible for just 20 to 25 seconds. Before we get started, we'd like to briefly recognize those who have made this event possible. First, many thanks to the honorary co-chairman of today's, today's event, President George H.W. Bush, the Honorable Bob Dole, and the Honorable John Dingell. Thanks also to the Honorary Congressional Committee, chaired by Senator James Inhofe and Congressman Sam Graves. The event would not have been possible without the efforts of five organizations. The Commemorative Air Force, the General Aviation Manufacturers Association, the International Council of Air Shows, the National Air Traffic Controllers Association, and the Texas Flying Legends Museum. The level of interagency cooperation required to plan and conduct today's flyover has been remarkable. We're here today because of the hard work and focused efforts of the Federal Aviation Administration, Transportation Security Administration, National Park Service, Secret Service, Park Police, Capitol Police, and DC Metro Police. We've also been fortunate to work closely with three other organizations to plan for our event, the Friends of the National World War II Memorial, the National Air and Space Museum, and Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine. Special thanks to Air and Space Magazine for their help in preparing the description of the flyover you'll see here today. Many thanks also to Smithsonian Air and Space Magazine for the spotter cards that they produced and made available to all of you. Produced to mimic spotter cards created in World War II to help citizens distinguish between friendly and enemy aircraft, they'll help you this afternoon to recognize each type of aircraft as they make their way down the mall. And finally, we'd like to recognize the generous support of our corporate sponsors. Several companies recognized the historic nature of this unprecedented event and made significant financial commitments to our flyover. In particular, many thanks for the leadership demonstrated by Honeywell Aerospace, Northrop Grumman, General Electric, and the Triumph Group. We are, we are also honored to welcome nearly 500 men who put on the uniform of their country three quarters of a century ago to defend freedom. Military veterans of the Second World War from the Army, the Army Air Forces, the Navy, the Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Merchant Marine. This event was conceived in large part to recognize the contributions they made to ultimate victory in Europe and the Pacific. Several of those veterans will actually be on board aircraft participating in the flyover. Urban Rahoy was a B-17 pilot for the Army Air Forces in World War II. He is now 96 years old and still an active bush pilot in Alaska. He drove here from Alaska by himself and will be on board of one of the B-17s. Rear Admiral Edward Whitey Feitner shot down nine enemy aircraft flying F-4F Wildcats and F-6F Hellcats for the Navy. Today he'll be flying in one of the AT-6 Texans that comes by early in the flyover. Al Tucker flew the P-38 Lightning in Europe during World War II before being shot down over Germany on his 22nd combat mission. He spent the last several months of the war as a prisoner of the Germans. Mr. Tucker will be in one of the Stearman biplanes during today's flyover. Weldon Britton lives in Haymarket, Virginia, but in 1945 he was a P-51 Mustang pilot based in the Pacific Theater and he'll be participating in the flyover as a passenger in one of our B-17 Flying Fortresses. 
Also with us today on the ground are four veterans who participated in a discussion forum last night at the National Air and Space Museum. Many thanks to Bud Anderson, Charles McGee, Chester Finnegan, and Carnegie Tarmasian, Tamasian for joining us last night and again here this afternoon. But as grateful as we are for their bravery, sacrifice, and service, we're here to celebrate not just G.I. Joe, but Rosie the Riveter as well. In a speech that he made in December of 1940, President Franklin Roosevelt recognized that the great arsenal of democracy would play a pivotal role in our country's anticipated involvement in the war that was already raging across much of the globe. President Roosevelt understood the raw power of the United States and its people when they focused their will and resources on a single common goal. He knew that once this country became involved in hostilities, the immense U.S. industrial complex would transition from peacetime manufacturer of automobiles, tractors, bicycles, and airliners to the wartime production of jeeps, tanks, machine guns, and warplanes. And he was right. For the second time in less than a quarter of a century, the American people were called on to help save the world from the forces of tyranny and oppression. And in the battlefields of Europe, the waters of the South Pacific, and the factories throughout this great country of ours, they responded to that challenge as Americans always have. In the intervening years, the stories of what those brave Americans did and how they did it have been told less and less frequently in the schools, and the history books in our schools, the narrative of World War II has been reduced to a few paragraphs or a day or two of instruction. Those stories deserve more. Americans should know that not so very long ago, our way of life, our freedom, and the fate of much of the world hung in the balance. And the resolve with which this country rose to that challenge is, even 70 years later, quite remarkable. Over the last several months, as we prepared for this commemoration of VE Day and the historic flyover that will begin in just a few minutes, several themes emerged. First, everyone participated. If not in uniform, then working in the factories, building the machines, and producing the munitions and supplies that our boys put to such effective use on dozens of different battlefields around the world. Second, there is a genuine heartfelt humility among these men who willingly walked into harm's way to protect and defend this country. As recently as yesterday evening, I have had a personal hero of mine tell me and a small group of people that he was just doing his job. And finally, and most poignantly, the deep respect that the veterans here with us today have for those they consider to be the real heroes of World War II, those men who didn't come home, the warriors who gave their last full measure of devotion to the epic struggle that took place seven decades ago in faraway places like Burma, Bataan, and Bastogne, like Carentan, Casino, and the Coral Sea, and like Tinian, Tunisia, and Tarawa. Today, it is our challenge and our great honor to use a remarkable collection of vintage military aircraft to tell their stories. We'll start the arsenal of democracy with the airplanes that taught our boys to fly, the trainers. In 1938, when General Hap Arnold, who was the commander of the U.S. Army Air Forces, considered this country's preparedness for war, he recognized that America did not have nearly enough airplanes or pilots to fly them. Three years before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Army Air Forces was comprised of 21,000 airmen and only 1,800 aircraft. But by the end of the war, the Army Air Forces included 2.3 million people, and production of aircraft of all types reached nearly 300,000. In a war that military leaders learned would be determined by air superiority, this unprecedented, almost inconceivable increase in American air power was widely recognized to be one of the most important factors in the Allies' victory. But three years before Pearl Harbor, that challenge had not yet been solved, and the United States was looking at an immense disparity between what it had and what it would soon need. So drawing on the expertise of prominent aviation leaders, the military created what would become the Civilian Pilot Training Program. By, this time, by the time the program ended, it had trained 435,000 pilots, including Senator John Glenn, 
the nation's top ace, Richard Bong, and one of our guests here today, triple ace, Colonel Bud Anderson. Now, ladies and gentlemen, approaching are the trainers. All U.S. military pilots completed a training program that was accomplished in three phases, primary, basic, and advanced. These future aviation warriors learned to fly in a wide variety of aircraft, among them the grasshoppers, the L-birds, like the Aronkas L-16 Champ, the Piper L-4, better known as the Piper Cub. Here they come now. Ladies and gentlemen, those in the plaza standing, please kneel down or find a seat so you're not blocking the view of people behind you. Thank you. In addition to serving as training aircraft, all of these planes had wartime functions as observation, reconnaissance, and liaison aircraft. One Army Air Force pilot recorded six confirmed kills of German tanks while flying a Piper L-4 Grasshopper outfitted with a bazooka. These two aircraft flying over a part of that L-bird gaggle. All nicknamed grasshoppers and all having a top speed of a blistering 90 to 95 miles an hour. All U.S. military pilots that completed a training program that was accomplished in three phases. Primary, basic, and advanced. This process was designed to gradually increase the complexity of a pilot's training. One of the iconic trainers was the Boeing Stearman biplane, an open cockpit aircraft constructed of wood, fabric, and tubular steel. There were more than two dozen different variants of the Stearman and more than 10,000 built. Used also by the RCAF, it earned another well-known nickname, the Cadet. These are the Stearman biplanes. Primary training introduced cadets to the principles of flight. Basic training introduced them to the complexities of radio communication and flying in formation. And advanced training was designed to prepare the air crews to go into combat. Another primary trainer was the Fairchild PT-19, a monoplane that was used by the Army Air Forces, the British Royal Air Force, and the Royal Canadian Air Force. Like the Stearman, the PT-19 was an open cockpit design. Advanced training was accomplished in aircraft like the North American AT-6 Texan, weighing in at nearly three tons with a 600 horsepower radial engine and retractable landing gear, the T-6 was designed to prepare pilots to fly state-of-the-art aircraft that they would use in combat. By the end of the war, North American aviation had built more than 15,000 Texans, including the AT-6 variant for the Army Air Forces and the SNJ version for the U.S. Navy.
When World War II began, the Bendix Corporation was a big name in aviation. The company built radios for both the B-25 Mitchell bomber and the P-40 Warhawk fighter. Bendix also manufactured the ball turrets for the B-25. The company is now Bendix King, which is a part of Honeywell Aviation, one of our sponsors of the Arsenal of Democracy flyover. There was perhaps no single company that made a bigger contribution to America's success in World War II in the air than the Grumman Corporation. Grumman designed and built the F-4F Wildcat and the F-6F Hellcat fighters and the TBF Avenger torpedo bomber, all planes that were essential to our country's success in naval battles in the Pacific. In 1994, the company merged with Northrop Corporation to form Northrop Grumman, a lead sponsor of today's arsenal of democracy flyover. We'll see several Grumman planes in the formation flyovers today. When the Triumph Group acquired Vought Aircraft Industries several years ago, they acquired a part of aviation and World War II history. Chance Vought built the F-4U Corsair, a critical tool in the war against Japan, and after several name changes and acquisitions, the company that was once Chance Vought is now part of the Triumph Group, a sponsor of today's flyover. General Electric Company was a vital part of the American arsenal of democracy. In addition to groundbreaking research and development of the first jet engine designed in the United States, GE pioneered the development and integration of turbochargers into aircraft engines. Many thanks to GE for also being a sponsor of today's flyover. In just a moment, the T-6 flight will be coming over. The Texans, also used by the Royal Canadian Air Force and the Royal Air Force, they called it the Harvard. It was indeed an aircraft of higher learning. Here come the Texans, the 600 horsepower, two flights of four. Listen to the sound that they make as they go over. There were also multi-engine trainers. One was known as the AT-11 Kansan, built by Beechcraft. Also had a light cargo designation of C-45. The Twin Beach, as it was known in civilian life, also served many functions, including as a training platform for bombing, navigation, and gunnery. With two 450 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engines, it'll have a great sound all its own. Look. Over the memorial, it's inbound now. Ladies and gentlemen, the AT-11, the Twin Beach. Inbound right now are two Curtis P-40 Warhawks, a 1937 design that at the time of Pearl Harbor was our number one fighter in the Pacific. Directly to our left, the two Curtis P-40 Warhawks with Allison V-12 engines in them, liquid-cooled. In April of 1942, after a series of stinging setbacks in the Pacific, Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle led 16 B-25 Mitchell bombers off the USS Hornet on a bombing raid to Tokyo and four other cities. 
The Raid was American improvisation at its finest. The B-25 wasn't designed to fly from an aircraft carrier, and an American strike on the heartland of Japan so soon after the attack on Pearl Harbor provided Americans with a much-needed boost in morale. Although the raid resulted in only minor damage to its targets, it had a profound impact on Japanese strategy, causing military leaders to be more concerned about attacks on Japan than they otherwise would be. The two surviving Doolittle Raiders, Dick Cole and Dave Thatcher, commemor Thatcher commemorated the 73rd anniversary of the raid just last month. Ladies and gentlemen, Three B-25 Mitchell bombers, two of them B-25s, one actually in Marine Corps PBJ-1 livery. In early June of 1942, as the Japanese and American navies converged on a tiny volcanic island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the stage was set for a dramatic shift in the momentum of the Pacific theater. Tipped off to Japanese plans by U.S. cryptographers who had broken Japanese radio codes, PBY Catalina flying boats were deployed from Midway Island to search hundreds of miles of ocean for enemy ships. One of them found the Japanese fleet steaming toward Midway and radioed the information to American military planners. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the PBY Catalina. From three U.S. carriers, Wildcat fighters flew escort for slower Devastator and Dauntless bombers, but logistical problems and bad luck plagued Americans as they began their attack. Most of the American torpedo bombers were shot out of the sky. In the first three hours of the battle, not a single U.S. bomber torpedo hit a Japanese ship, despite eight separate attacks by a total of 94 airplanes. Then the tide turned. As the Japanese focused their attention on the torpedo bombers flying just off the surface of the water, SBD Dauntless dive bombers attacked from a higher altitude, fatally damaging three of four Japanese carriers. An hour later, a second attack by dive bombers destroyed the fourth Japanese carrier. The balance of naval power in the Pacific had shifted permanently. We're right now awaiting the SBD Dauntlesses and the FM2 Wildcats. Wildcats were designed by Grumman as the F4F, but were also produced in great numbers by General Motors under the, under the designation FM2 Wildcat. The Wildcat and the Dauntless. When the U.S. Marines stormed the shores of Guadalcanal in August of 1942, Japanese conquests had reached their peak. This bold, unexpected offensive would prove to be a critical turning point in the war in the Pacific. A small but strategic airfield on the island was the focal point of six months of fierce battles on the ground, in the air, and on the sea. And by the time the Japanese conceded the island, in February of 1943, nearly 25,000 Japanese and 1,600 Americans had been killed, with thousands more dead from malaria and other tropical diseases. Central to the battle was the venerable Grumman F-4F Wildcat, which operated from carriers by U.S. Navy pilots and from Henderson Field by Marine Corps pilots throughout the Guadalcanal campaign. Although badly outmatched by the faster and more agile Mitsubishi Zero, the Wildcats of Guadalcanal's Cactus Air Force were able to hold their own because of their rugged construction and the unique battle tactics developed by the naval aviators who flew them. By the end of 1943, the first Grumman F-6F Hellcats, a new and far superior Grumman fighter, were being deployed to the Pacific Theater. 
But during the early critical battles in the Pacific in 1942 and 43, it was the Wildcat that shouldered the burden as America's principal carrier-based fighter. The Wildcats that you'll see here today are both the FM2 vari variant built by General Motors during the last years of the war and deployed on smaller escort carriers for anti-submarine and picket duty. Interestingly, pilots of the Wildcats have told me that rather than flipping a switch to raise the landing gear, after they took off, they maintained about 90 or 95 miles an hour, put their left hand on the stick instead of the right hand, and took the right hand and had to crank the landing gear up 29 turns to get it up. It was not a fun airplane in the, in the, uh, in the pattern. Ladies and gentlemen, here come the Wildcats. Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto was commander-in-chief of the Japanese Combined Fleet and mastermind behind Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. In the spring of 1943, American codebreakers intercepted and decoded a message with Yamamoto's itinerary for an airplane trip between two islands in the Solomon Islands area of the South Pacific. On April 18th, a flight of 18 Lockheed P-38 Lightnings was dispatched from Kukum Field on Guadalcanal on a long, low-altitude, circuitous route designed to evade enemy radar and maximize the element of surprise. Here comes the fork-tailed devil, the P-38 Lightning, which shot down Yamamoto's plane. The mission, the mission named Operation, named Operation Vengeance not only avenged the deaths of 2,400 Americans at Pearl Harbor, but it also deprived the Japanese of one of their finest military strategists. Known as Hitler's gas station, Ploiesti was a huge complex of Romanian oil refineries that supplied Germany with more than one-third of its fuel. After identifying it as a high-priority target, military strategists initially opted for a single large raid by B-24 bombers attacking from an altitude of just 200 feet. Flying the mission at low altitude would help the Americans avoid enemy radar and increase the accuracy of their bombs, but the low altitude would also put the aircraft and crews at greater risk. The B-24 was selected for the mission because it was the only U.S. bomber that could manage the 2,400-mile round trip from Libya to Ploiesti and back. Though complex and finicky to fly and maintain, the U.S. produced more B-24 bombers than any other. And in 1944, assembly lines rolled out a new one every 58 minutes at plants in San Diego, Fort Worth, Tulsa, and Detroit. But the Americans lost nearly a third of their bombers and 500 airmen during that low-level raid on August 1st of 1943. So military leaders adopted a new strategy of daily raids from a higher altitude with long-range fighter escorts like the P-51 Mustangs, incrementally destroying Ploiesti's production capacity over a period of 14 months. As attacks on the oil refineries of Romania continued during the summer of 1944, American forces pushed into France. Army Air Forces Commander General Hap Arnold noted the increasing number of vehicles along the side of the road that had just run out of gas. Here's the Liberator with the Mustangs.
In the early days of the war, after the Allies had decided that the British would conduct nighttime bombing raids on German targets and the Americans would bomb during daylight hours, mission losses were horrific. Without fighter escorts, the U.S. bombers in particular suffered unsustainable losses to German fighters and anti-aircraft flak. By some estimates, the fatality rate of B-17 and B-24 crews was put at nearly 50%. That began to change with the introduction of the P-51 Mustang as a long-range fighter. When outfitted with external fuel tanks made of a kind of paper mache, here come the Mustangs. Mustangs also flown by the 332nd Fighter Group, the Red Tail Squadron of the Tuskegee Airmen. By 1944, the German Air Force was struggling to survive. In a single week that February, the Allies sought to hasten the end. Operation Argument, better known as Big Week, was a series of large-scale Royal Air Force and U.S. bombing raids on German aviation factories. On several raids, more than 1,000 bombers were sent against their targets. Together, the Allies dropped over 20 million pounds of ordnance between February 20th and February 25th. The raids were also intended to bait German fighters into the air where nearly 900 P-47 and P-51 Mustangs engaged them. The German Air Force lost a third of its remaining single-engine fighters that month and 18% of its pilots, but U.S. forces suffered as well in more than three thousand sorties. 247 B-17s were lost, despite the bomber's almost uncanny ability to withstand damage and bring our airmen home. Outfitted with 13 50 caliber machine guns in eight different locations on the plane, the 10-member crews of the B-17 flew this aircraft, earning the nickname Flying Fortress, with the ability to fly long distances with a bomb payload of about 6,000 pounds. These four-engine aircraft were the workhorse of America's strategic bombing campaign in Europe. Four 1,200-horsepower motors allowed the B-17 to lumber at high altitudes, but it was not a pressurized aircraft. When they had to fly up where it was cold, literally, crew members wore suits that had electric wires in them to keep them warm. They wore oxygen masks, and they would come back from missions with marks on their faces from frostbite that was created from being such high altitude and such low temperatures. In all, over 12,700 B-17s were built, remaining flying today anywhere in the world, somewhere around a dozen. It's part of the reason that we love to see these airplanes fly. So few are still in existence today. The P-51 Mustang long-range fighters had a production total of somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000, and about 160 are still flyable around the world today. Now, we're still waiting for the two B-17 bombers that will be coming across here very, very shortly. They were part of our heavy bomber fleet along with the B-24 Liberator we saw fly by earlier. There were about 18,000 B-24 Liberators made, more than any other uh, American aircraft during the war.
Here come the B7, the first B17. And the second. The Flying Fortress, 10 crew members in each aircraft. The first Allied soldiers in France on D-Day arrived by parachute just after midnight on June 6, 1944. 13,000 paratroopers from the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions made the trip in more than 800 C-47 transport aircraft. These lead elements jumped into Normandy to secure a series of bridges, causeways, and crossroads vital to the success of the Allied invasion of France. The C-47 began its life as the Douglas DC-3, an airplane credited with revolutionizing the airline industry. And with the outbreak of hostilities, the plane was reconfigured as a military transport. C-47s kept in China uh, in the war flew supplies, fuel, and weapons, and personnel from muddy airfields in India across the Himalayan range to bases in China. It was called flying the hump. After D-Day, the C-47 supported the Allied drive into Germany, including flying critical resupply missions to surrounded U.S. forces during the Battle of the Bulge. Here comes the C-47. After 1945, General Dwight D. Eisenhower credited four weapons to winning the war, the bazooka, the jeep, the atomic bomb, and the C-47. About 11,000 of those were built, and about 1,100 remain flyable around the world today, some with turbine conversions on their engines. The June 19, 1944 Battle of Lady Gulf was the largest carrier-to-carrier -carrier battle in history. In a flotilla that, that included 15 aircraft carriers and more than 100 supporting ships, the U.S. Navy arrived to capture the island of Saipan for use as a base for B-29 super fortresses to bomb Japan. By nightfall on the 19th, Japan had lost two-thirds of the 400 carrier aircraft it had committed to the battle. One Hellcat pilot shot down six Japanese dive bombers in less than eight minutes. American losses were 29 aircraft plus a nominal damage to a single battleship. The superiority of U.S. pilots was so dramatic that the battle came to be known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. The battle also included the loss of 11 Japanese ships, including three aircraft carriers. The U.S. Navy aircraft attacked enemy ships with Hellcats, Dauntless dive bombers, Grumman TBM Avenger torpedo bombers, and the Curtis SB-2C Helldiver. What you will see here today are two TBM torpedo bombers and a single Curtis Helldiver, the only Helldiver of over 7,000 built that's still flying today. The battle was decisive and eliminated the Japanese Navy's ability to conduct large-scale large scale carrier operations, giving the U.S. a new level of naval dominance that lasted until the end of the war. Ladies and gentlemen, we have two special guests with us today, two special statesmen, two veterans, Senator Robert Dole and Senator Warner. They're in the front row. Let's hear it for them. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, here come the two TBM Avengers and the Curtis Helldiver, nicknamed the Big Tail Beast. The Battle of the Bulge was Germany's last major offensive campaign in World War II. It began in mid-December of 1944 as a surprise attack on American forces in the Ardennes area of Belgium. Before it was over, the battle would involve more than 500,000 Germans, 600,000 Americans, and 50,000 British troops. Characterized initially by cold temperatures and overcast skies, the battle demonstrated how thoroughly air support had been integrated into contemporary military operations. The Allies' inability to dominate the skies over the battlefield 
prolonged the German offensive. And conversely, the return of air support helped the Allies achieve victory in the battle. It began on December 16th with a German attack designed to catch the Allies unaware and split their forces in half. The Germans wanted to capture the Belgian harbor of Antwerp. That initial offensive against unprepared American defenses created a large 80-mile wide bulge in the Allied lines. One of the aircraft that drove the Germans back was the A-26 Invader built by Douglas. Immortalized forever by the photo of Marines raising the U.S. flag over Mount Suribachi, the Battle of Iwo Jima helped to secure three airfields and provided the United States with an important staging area for much, the much-anticipated invasion of the Japanese homeland. It is a testament to the ferocity of the fighting on Iwo Jima that more than 25,000 U.S. Marines were killed or wounded during 35 days of fighting in February and March of 1945 and nearly 19,000 Japanese soldiers were killed, the only battle of the war in which U.S. casualties exceeded Japanese. The chance-fought F-4U Corsair was critical to the American success on Iwo Jima. Initially designed as a carrier-based fighter, the pilot sat far back in the fuselage, and his view was restricted because of the 2,000-horsepower motor, the 13-foot-plus diameter propeller, and a huge fuel tank, making landings extremely challenging on the pitching deck of a carrier. So early models went to land-based marine pilots who put the aircraft speed and heavy armament to effective use in both dogfights and ground support. Eventually, Corsair pilots shot down 11 Japanese aircraft for every Corsair lost, and by the beginning of 1945, Marine Corps pilots were flying low-level missions with bombs, rockets, and napalm in support of their fellow Marines on the beaches and in the jungles of the small islands throughout the South Pacific, including Iwo Jima. The Japanese called this airplane Whistling Death. Some of you remember VMA 214, the Black Sheep Squadron, led by Pappy Boyington. They called him Pappy because he was older than the rest of the guys in the squadron. He was 28. He also racked up 28 kills during his career. Ladies and gentlemen, from the right and directly in front of you all, here come the F4U Corsair, the Bent Wing Bird. The B-29 Super Fortress, built by Boeing, could carry 20,000 pounds of bombs and targets to more than 2,000 miles away. At an altitude of 30,000 feet, it was able to fly above most of Japan's home island defenses. Instead of conventional gun turrets, the B-29's weapons poked from sealed blisters on the fuselage, linked through a remote control system that was a marvel of technology in the 1940s. By the time B-29s entered the war, an earlier generation of heavy bombers had leveled much of Germany. So the super forces were deployed to China and later to Tinian in the Marianas Islands. The move to the islands put the aircraft to within 1,500 miles of Tokyo, well within the bombers' range. With their large numbers and vast payloads, it wasn't long before the B-29s had destroyed nearly every strategic target in Japan. The only aircraft then capable capable of delivering the world's first nuclear bombs, modified super forces, joined their standard comrades on Tinian in the early summer of 1945. On August 6th, the B-29 in Olegay dropped a uranium bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Three days later, Boxcar destroyed Nagasaki with a plutonium bomb. On August 14th, Japanese surrendered unconditionally. The surrender was formalized in a ceremony on board the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay on September 2nd of 1945. Compared to the 12,000 plus B-17s and 18,000 plus Liberators that were built, Production of the B-29 Super Fortress was about 4,000. 
It was rushed into service. It was fraught with engine problems so great that engines were routinely swapped out after only 25 hours of flying time. Just shy of 4,000 B-29 Super Fortresses were built by Boeing and also by Bell. And also Martin Aircraft. The ability for the B-29 to fly at such, al such high altitudes is because it was the first U.S. aircraft that was pressurized, enabling the air crew to be operating the aircraft in normal kinds of temperatures. Ladies and gentlemen, here comes the B-29. Over 12 million Americans answered the nation's call over the course of the Second World War. We are going to have now what is known as a missing man formation. It serves to remind us of those who sacrificed their future for that of our nation. And it's a tradition which dates back to World War II. The symbolic moment when a single aircraft breaks formation and soars skyward, leaving behind his comrades in arms. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please help us recognize our fallen heroes and stand while Taps is being played. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be seated. Thanks to the Texas Flying Legends for performing the Missing Man Formation. Seventy years ago, the world rejoiced, ladies and gentlemen. London's Trafalgar Square was the scene of an immense impromptu street party. Joyful Frenchmen celebrated on the Champs-Élysées in Paris, and vast crowds gathered in Moscow's Red Square. The United States, although the country knew, in the United States, although the country knew there was still much work to be done in the Pacific, huge celebrations were held in Chicago, Los Angeles, Miami, and especially New York's Times Square. Every contributor to the arsenal of democracy had done their part, from the servicemen fighting for their country overseas, to the factory workers and businesses providing those servicemen with the weapons of war so vital to their success, to the families who went without so that the boys overseas could have all that they needed. Victory was a collaborative effort, a triumph that the entire country could be proud of. And seven decades later, we are no less proud. For all those here today who played a role in America's victory in World War II, whether in military or civilian capacity, thank you for your service. For everybody else, thank you for joining us here today to commemorate our country's victory in World War II and recognize the men and women who made it possible. 
Many thanks once again to the government agencies that helped make today's flyover possible, to the nonprofit organizations that helped to plan and conduct this historic event, to the pilots participating in the flyover, and especially to our sponsors, including General Electric, Honeywell Aerospace, Triumph Group, and Northrop Grumman. My name is Rob Ryder, and it has been my distinct pleasure to spend time with you here today and commemorate the U.S. victory in World War II. Travel safely, and when you have the opportunity, be sure to thank a vet. As a guardian on an honor flight a few years back, I was handed a T-shirt. I wanted to wear a collared shirt. They said, no, you'll wear the T-shirt. I looked at the back of the T-shirt, and it says, if you can read this, thank a teacher. If you can read this in English thank a vet. God bless you all and God bless America.